I'm Fernando Guerra, professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles at Loyola Marymount University and moderator of the Center's Urban Lecture Series. This year marks the culmination of several important events for our city. In addition to this being the 10th annual lecture series the Center has organized, it's also the university's 100th anniversary of serving Los Angeles with its educational experience. Also this year, the city will remember the tragedy of the 1992 riots that occurred 20 years ago. As Angelinos, we should not forget both the physical and emotional scars these disturbances had on our city. For this reason, the Center for the Study of LA is sponsoring a survey of Los Angeles residents and their attitudes and opinions over the last 20 years. This survey will assist our faculty, students, and policymakers to better understand Los Angeles. Since no picture is complete without looking at the past, present, and future, the topic of this year's lecture series is 20 years after the riots, where is LA now? where we hear from the several of the city's current leaders, as well as those running for mayor of Los Angeles in the 2013 election. The series is important for several reasons. It provides an interdisciplinary education to hundreds of students at Loyola Marymount University, and it brings together top government officials, business and community leaders, and students, and the general public to discuss pressing issues facing Los Angeles and solutions to the city's problems. We hope you enjoy today's panel. For more information about the Center for the Study of LA, its research studies, or upcoming panels, please visit our website at www.lmu.edu slash CSLA. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University. I am Fernando Guerra, a professor and director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. The university is currently celebrating its 100th anniversary. In addition, the Urban Lecture Series that you are watching tonight is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Finally, uh, the city will be commemorating, I don't know if celebrating, but the 20th anniversary of the 1992 riots. Uh, here to discuss the city of Los Angeles 20 years after the riots, the mayoralty, and everything else that's going on in Los Angeles, we have Eric Garcetti. He is a native Angelino, I think fourth generation, uh, went to uh, Columbia University for his degrees, then became a Rhodes Scholar and went to Oxford University and the London School of Economics. Uh, he then worked at uh, Occidental College and uh, USC. Uh, he didn't have enough credentials to be at Loyola Marymount University. Um, <laughs> then from that, he uh, went to become a, an elected official, uh, getting elected to the Los Angeles City Council in 2001. He was re-elected in 2005 and then re-elected in 2009. He is termed out in 2013 and at the same time is running for mayor in 2013. Um, in addition, he was elected president of the city council. I believe it was in 2005, 2005. Yeah. and then I think you're re-elected every two years, so 2007, 2009, and 2011. And he re recently gave up being a council president so he can dedicate his time to uh, his district and also running for mayor. Uh, Eric Garcetti, council member mayoral candidate. Um, why are you running for mayor? Well, thank you for having me, uh, Professor Guerra, and it's great to be here with all of you in the LMU community, which is such a, an integral part of Los Angeles. You continue to produce amazing students, thinkers, um, and, and activists. I think the, the service mission that you have here um, is very close to the answer to that question for me. I've always believed that when you're given a lot in life, you're, you give more back. And a city that has given me and my family such incredible opportunities, ones I wouldn't have ever imagined, um, is a city worth investing in and staying here. This has always been my home. As you mentioned, I'm a fourth generation Angelino. My uh, great grandparents and grandparents came here fleeing war. On my father's side, the Mexican Revolution. My mother's side, the Russo-Japanese War. Both sides settled in Boyle Heights, grew up on the east side. My dad grew up in South Los Angeles and graduated from LAUSD schools there. My mom grew up in West Los Angeles, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and now I live in the heart of the city. So this city pulses through my blood. This is a place that for me is the best city anywhere in the world, but it's a defining moment when we have to get our city back to work, when we have to believe in our city again, and when we have to make sure we reform City Hall so that all of you have opportunities when you graduate from here, or young people who are seeking opportunities in this city can say, not only do I want to stay in Los Angeles, but LA is the best place for the best opportunities anywhere in the world. And mostly, I want to get people excited about LA again. I want outsiders to feel that, and I want those of us that are here already 
uh, to feel like Los Angeles is, which I believe, the most American of cities. And it is who we say we are as Americans, but we oftentimes are not in reality. A place where it doesn't matter what language you speak, it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter what religion you practice, who your parents were, how much money you have. What matters is your ideas. What matters is your heart. What matters is your ability to work hard. And certainly that's been my experience here in this city. And I want to be mayor having turned around the heart of this city and my district. And I want to do that throughout LA and make that radiate out again in the world. 1992, we saw the city uh, erupt in riots. Um, your father at that time, I think, was running for district attorney. He was not yet district Correct. attorney, but I think he was um, the number two or three person mm -hmm. in, in that office. Um, what do you remember about the riots? What do you remember about your dad's response to the riots? You know, I, interest, I had an interesting experience. I don't know if any of you ever listened to StoryCorps on NPR. It's just uh, Americans interviewing Americans about interesting things. And they were here in Los Angeles, and they asked me to speak about my memories 20 years ago. I was right where you all are now. I was a college student. Um, and yet, interestingly enough, I, as was mentioned, I went to school in New York City. I left the day before the riots. I also missed the earthquake two years later by one day, so my parents started saying, stop leaving LA, bad things happen whenever you, you go. Or, but, or just stay away and don't come back. <laughs> exactly, or never come back. But they, they, you know, at that moment, I remember being in my dorm room in New York City, watching my city burn, watching the neighborhoods that my dad grew up in, that my family was from in South Los Angeles, seeing the aftermath and people take to the streets who you know, had felt like they were hopeless and helpless. I watched my dad, I remember, take up a broom. And one of the most powerful things, there was no television cameras around, uh, with some Korean merchants who just took to Wilshire Boulevard to say, this city will not be beaten down, and just to start cleaning up when the fires had all died down, when our police department and others had literally abandoned neighborhoods and abandoned the people in them. And I think at that moment how I felt was, how can this be my city? This is not what my city is about. This is not my narrative. This is not the diversity that made me possible. This is not the city of justice that I've always believed in. And we saw at that moment things that were very sick and diseased about this city. Some of the main institutions, our police department, our court system, our racial divide, not just between whites and blacks, but the manifestation with Asian Americans and blacks and Latinos. And the complexity of that gave us all a challenge of how we were to rebuild a city of angels. But I remember that moment of just feeling intense fear, intense hopelessness, but a determination that Los Angeles would rise again. When you think about what caused the riots, there was obviously the, um, what happened in Simi Valley and the uh, police officers getting off by an all-white jury. Um, but there were some underlying aspects to it. Do you believe that in the next five years there could be another riot? I, I don't think so. There's always the potential, but I think it's much, much less likely. And it's interesting, right after that happened, it wasn't just in vogue in Los Angeles, but around the country, but particularly in LA, a lot of people reacted to that saying, oh, we just didn't know each other. So let's get blacks and Korean Americans together and talk about one another. Hey, what do you eat? What language do you speak? Tell me about your culture. And I always found at the time that was a very superficial exercise. I mean, it's nice to learn those things, but that's not a path for progress forward. And I think what we learned in the years that came afterwards where it's not just about discussion and dialogue, it's about actual shared project and work. <coughs> So that in my own district, for instance, now, when I walk a, a street, and I, when I first campaigned, I went door to door and walked holes through my shoes, and I never stopped doing that. Every month or two, I'll go out with a couple dozen friends and, and uh, folks that are in my office, and we go door to door and just knock on people's doors proactively. And when I'm on a street in central Hollywood, let's say, where there's an Armenian family next to a Guatemalan family, uh, next to a Thai family, next to an Anglo family, next to a Cameroon uh, family, what they want to do is not just learn about each other's cultures, they want to clean up their block. They want to get the gang out. They want to take an empty lot and transform it or turn around a school that isn't performing the way that it should. And when we find those projects to work on together, when I've been able to do that with my community, they learn about each other as a byproduct, but not as the main product. The main product is a shared belief of building a great city with schools, parks, jobs that work for everybody. And I think that if anything, that's the lesson we've learned and why it's much less likely now. It's a much more integrated city. We have much more common purpose. And I think we know that leadership is not just about dialogue, it's about work. So 
your father immediately gets elected. Uh, well, the riot, the riots happen in May, and he's in an election in June and then a, a general election in, in November. He wins and becomes district attorney. He runs for re-election in 1996 and wins. He runs for re-election in 2000 and loses. And then immediately in 2001, you run for office. Now, talk to me about watching your father lose that, that experience and why you would even want to be involved in something because, you, you know, you're, you're, uh, it, it wasn't a good time for your dad when, when he lost. Well, let, let me bring another person in the conversation, which is my mother as well. My mother and my father both taught me a lot about public service. My mother ran a community foundation here in Los Angeles. My father, before he ran for DA, he was just a, a prosecutor, dep deputy district attorney who worked his way up, anonymous. A lot of people think I grew up in politics. He didn't even run for DA until the year that I graduated from college. So, you know, I just grew up as a, a normal Angelino here. But both of them taught me that value. And so first and foremost, when I told my dad, it was actually in 2000 when he was up for re-election, I was interested maybe in running for city council. He said, didn't you learn anything? <laughs> you know, didn't you watch me? And at the time he was, you know, he loved what he did, but it's a very, um, it's a very raw thing to do. You're in the, the limelight all the time, you know, you go to the grocery store and um, if you look a mess, you know, somebody's going to come up to me and Abuelita, you know, this senior citizen came up to me at Ralph's the other day and, you know, wanted to talk to me about her street, you, you are never off the job. And so I think he was a little bit surprised. He wanted me to maybe be a musician or something else and not necessarily go into public life. Um, but certainly when he lost, it was, it was a shock. And he'd always said, know who you are before you run, because it's who you're gonna be one day when you leave. And you may leave office if you're an elected official on your terms, but you may not. And so you have to know at the end of the day who you are, what you stand for. He left on terms that he didn't want to. Right. He was running for a third time. And as a son, of course, it hurt. Well, wh why did he lose? You know, I think it was interesting. A lot of people think it was because of high-profile uh, cases like the Simpson trial. He actually got reelected after that mm -hmm. trial. I think at, at the end of the day, one of the things that I learned was in politics, you have to have more than just a good heart. My father has an amazing heart. He was the best dad I could ever imagine growing up with my mother, too. I love them dearly. You chose your parents well. I did, I did. At the hospital, I said, I'll take them. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, I learned that how you communicate and what you say and the way you come across is as important as doing the right thing. And we all wish as idealists it was just like, do the right thing, and no matter what, the, the truth will come through. I know what my dad did, bringing up domestic violence as, a, as an issue that really had, had not had a focus nationally until he really zeroed in on that with child support because he knew that for so many children that live in poverty, not getting the child support is the most important thing and that if you go to folks on death row, 95% of them you know, didn't have child support from their family when they were in a broken household. But those things also can rebound against you. Yeah, you one, la one last yeah. question about your dad. Sure. Uh, and then we'll really focus in on sure, you. Sure, um, What's your dad doing? He is, it's funny, my life is funny this way in which you know, role reversals happen between fathers and sons, sons and fathers. And, and so you're supporting him? I'm supporting him, no. absolutely. No, not quite yet. <laughs> He's doing all right. But he, uh, he came to me after he lost. And he said, what do you think I should do, Eric? And I gave him back the advice he had given me. And he said, no matter what you do in life professionally, follow your heart. And he'd always been a very gifted photographer. He loved photography. He, was, he won amateur prizes. And I said, what about if you started taking pictures? And he you know, worked for National Geographic, something like that. And lo and behold, about a year later, he saw these iron workers hanging off iron beams downtown at the Disney Hall that was being constructed. And he knew the iron workers because he was close with the union uh, that represents them. And he talked his way on site and took a, a, about five months of pictures of these incredible men and one woman who were iron workers, you know, risking their lives. And it turned into the most successful uh, project. He sold it as a book, and he's done seven books of photography. On the side, he's also a producer on The Closer, if you've ever watched that on TNT. So he is now an artist. He left law, politics far behind, and it gives me the courage, that, and should give all of us the courage, jump into something new in life, and you, as long as you have the courage of your conviction, who knows what will happen. So um, 2001, you decide to run for city council. I remember uh, meeting you the first time and someone talking to me about you. I said, oh, that kid doesn't have a chance. <laughs> Number one, the Garcetti name. The, the guy just lost. Right. Number two, who is this guy? Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's like this uh, Rhodes Scholar from London, mm -hmm. professor type. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, he's not, uh, he's, he's not going to win. Yep. 
How come you won? You know, you never know exactly, um, but I think it was a combination of things. One, we just talked to more people than anybody else in that race. I didn't expect to win. Who were you running against? I was running against um, about 12 other opponents. It got winnowed down to about nine, I think, of us. Um, the, my predecessor's brother was running, an incumbent assembly member in the area. My predecessor's predecessor on the city council, Mike Wu, um, who I ultimately was in a runoff with, a top deputy to my predecessor. So I think people put me about fourth or fifth. I was 29 at the time when I announced. Um, I just thought that there was a need for a young voice in there, kind of a new vision for LA, and that I would, I, I, I did a gut check and I say, well, I'd be happy even if I lose having done this race. And when I said yes, then it was okay. I, I wasn't doing it and I wasn't gonna be, it would have been tough to lose, but I wasn't gonna be crushed if I, if I didn't uh, win. We went door to door to more households. Like I said, we, I walked holes through my shoes. I have them in my office today as reminders of what that campaign was like. We had high school students from the area who spoke you know, English and Spanish and Thai and Armenian and Russian who would go door to door. Um, and we also, I think, put out there a kind of a sense of hope and optimism. And what was interesting, having just seen my dad go through a loss, is there were voters who loved my dad who I'd meet and they'd say, I loved your dad, but why should I vote for you? And other ones who said, I hated your dad, but tell me why I should vote for you. And I found voters to be actually very fair. You have to make your own case. And at the end of the day, people vote not just on the policies and the resume, but the feeling that they have about you at the front door. When they answer a door, when you knock on their door, and you start to engage with them, they have a feeling about you. And if it's a good feeling, anybody can win. So you win in May, you get sworn in in July. This is July 2001. Mm -hmm. And then immediately we have 9-11. Yep. And you know, what's the city's response to that? Even though it doesn't happen in Los Angeles, one of the planes was on the way to Los Angeles. Um, Mayor Hahn at that time, who got elected at the same time that you did, is stuck in Washington, D.C., can't get back. It empowers the city council. Mm -hmm. What's going on? Well, we went uh, five stories down underneath City Hall uh, East, which at the time was our emergency operations center. It was built to withstand you know, a nuclear attack. Um, and we went down to this bunker. And we saw the cameras around the city. Um, there was this sense that, yes, we were being targeted, and nobody knew what was going to come next. And we were down there, and as you mentioned, our mayor was out of town, so the council president becomes the acting mayor. My friend, who I had been kind of a, a whip for in, in helping him get elected president, Alex Padilla. And so all of us were there reassuring the public, getting what information we had. And it hit me that this job was not something where you're going to have an internship and learn it. It was day one, serious, big leagues. This is a world-class city with world-class issues that you face. And, uh, you know, it was a real education for me at that moment that this, we had the power to affect people's lives in very profound ways, but we had a responsibility to do it the right way. Um, and not just that day, but to reassure people, remember, for years after that, people had the sense of insecurity that it was going to be happening and to dispel that and to get people back to this city to get our economy going and to deal with the fear that was in the aftermath. So that was about 10 years ago, 11, no, more than that. Um, but how has the city of Los Angeles changed in the last 20 years since the riots. Half of that time, mm -hmm. you've been on the Los Angeles City Council. Mm -hmm. So what's the biggest difference between Los Angeles 2012 and Los Angeles 2002? Um, I think in the last 10 years, the biggest change that we've had in the world is we went from a moment, even with 9-11, where we had, I think, right afterward, remember, the world's sympathy. I mean, we had, I remember reading a story of Maasai warriors in Kenya who had almost nothing when they heard that 3,000 people had died in a single day. They sold their cows and sent the money to America. We had, you know, iron workers, steel workers, excuse me, in, in India who were in the foundries that were taking the World Trade Center and melting it down. They'd stop for moments of silence and prayer beforehand. And then we had this transformation where that goodwill around the world was, in my uh, opinion, uh, really wasted. We went into a war that we probably shouldn't have rushed into. And um, Los Angeles has gone through, I think, a moment where we felt on top just before 9-11 to suddenly being very insecure. And that's not unique to Los Angeles, it's the United States right now. We're not sure of our place in the world. We're the most powerful country probably ever and certainly in the world today, but we're not sure of our future. So for me, you know, if the body felt a little sick after 9-11, um, you know, we're working on the restoration of that health to our city, of our economy, and defining who we are post-Cold War, you know, what is this city's economy going to be 
based on and who are we? And I think we're beginning to see some really hopeful lights. So would you say the city is safer now than 20, 10 years ago? Absolutely. We're, we're, this was the safest year this past year in terms of the number one threat to us is not international terrorism, it's street crime, it's gang crime, it's neighborhood-based incidents. And this was the safest year since Dwight Eisenhower was president. We've built up a police force that is the strongest it's ever been, that looks like our communities and comes from our communities, but we've also invested in youth intervention programs that have helped bring that down. So we are absolutely safer. You can never, on the terrorist front, prevent anything from happening, but unquestionably this is a sa the safest city I've ever lived in in my entire life. Well, in general, do you think that LAPD is doing an excellent, good, poor, or bad job? I think they're doing an excellent job. I think it is remarkable. How, how do you measure that? What's the metrics that one uses to evaluate a police department? I Not only here in LA, yeah. but anywhere in urban America. I think three things. One, you look at the crime rate. Two, you look at the successes that they have in reflecting a city. But three, because nobody will ever be perfect, you look at how they deal with failure. I was the acting mayor, for instance, on May Day when there was immigrant rights protests that happened and a crackdown that happened that, was, that not only went after some of the protesters with overzealous police officers, but also some members of the media. And the response of the LAPD to relearn and to retrain and to come up with new policies for dealing with those sorts of situations was remarkable. I couldn't have imagined that 10 years ago, let alone 20 or 30 right. years ago. Right. So those, uh, you don't just judge a department by its successes, but how it deals with its failures. So you said you were acting mayor. The mayor at that point, I believe, was in El Salvador. Or yeah, he was in Mexico on the way to El Salvador. Okay. Yeah. And so, that, so as president of the council, mm -hmm. which you were for a long yep. time, you are acting mayor every time the mayor is out of the city, out of the, out of the state, state, out of the country. Out so it's state. out of the state. He can be in Eureka, California. He's still mayor, but if he goes over the line to Las Vegas, I was the mayor. Okay. So what are your great accomplishments as acting mayor? <laughs> well, I dealt with some, some moments of crisis. Those situations, you know, where um, we had the May Day, um, where we would have incidents like uh, we just actually in council today got a $300,000 check from the police officer who we thought had been shot, remember this, right. uh, a couple, year and a half LA, ago? LA Unified LA, Police Officer? Uh, he was actually, uh, yeah, he was L LA Unified Police Officer, and uh, he faked it. No, he's LAPD, sorry, okay. but it, we had LA Unified Police involved. And uh, so those moments when suddenly we had a manhunt looking for who the person was that did this, calming the city down, trying to get people uh, to, to help us as um, witnesses. It's really crisis management when you're acting mayor that you have to deal mm -hmm. most with. And also then at those moments, you know, making some of the big decisions, signing pieces of legislation, it's, that's when you lose your checks and balance. I can actually pass a piece of legislation as council president and then sign it later in the afternoon as acting mayor. So I don't know if there was any check and balance there. But we really, I think what I learned first and foremost was the importance of quick decisions, of asserting a, a calm but strong demeanor in those moments of crisis, and also getting to know um, and manage what right now is a very complicated city. Um, not just your own city, but other jurisdictions like our school district and our county. So, as you know, the uh, Charlie Beck police chief is probably halfway through his first five-year term, mm -hmm. and the next mayor, mm -hmm. you maybe, uh, would have to reappoint them. Uh, from what you know right now, would you reappoint Charlie Beck? I, I love Charlie Beck. I think he's an extraordinary policeman and leader. Uh, when I was... Um, uh, just a new council member. He was actually the captain at Rampart Station, which, of course, we all know the name of because of the Rampart scandal, and he was the guy who had to turn it around. I've seen him tackle some of the most difficult problems, civil liberties, reinvesting in, in communities where there was corruption in the police department, um, tackling homelessness in a, a humane way, um, and I've been very impressed every step of the way. So um, I am a big fan of Charlie, um, and if he continues that job, he would certainly be on track. Yeah. Um, we often hear the discussion about uh, community policing, civilian review, um, and, and police recruitment. Mm -hmm. When you think about community uh, policing, what does that mean? You know, community policing means a, a number of things. One, though, that the police department looks like Los Angeles and feels like this city, understands the nuances of our immigrant community, of our uh, ethnic diversity, that there's women on the force, that there's openly gay and lesbian officers, that when they deal with the murder of a transgendered woman, that they can uh, adopt and understand that community. It's really understanding the diversity of Los Angeles. But it's also an investment in police officers, not just being in cars and in helicopters, but on the street. In Hollywood, for instance, one of the reasons we've had such a dramatic turnaround in my own district in Hollywood, we've seen an increase almost five-fold in tax increment, which is a measure of economic growth in the last decade, 500% nearly 
It was because we put cops on the beat on Hollywood Boulevard, walking right there on the street, reassuring people. That's community policing to me. And lastly, it's also not just the police. Community policing is about investing in the young people who right now still are the ones most likely to be victims of and to commit crimes. I had a 16-year-old girl in my district walking with her boyfriend um, in Glassell Park, northeast LA, hand in hand, 6.30, one afternoon, and was, somebody rolled up on her and shot her in the back and killed her. And it hit me really hard because as council member, you deal with people's most triumphant moments, but they let you into these most tragic moments of their lives. And I said, there is no way that should have happened. It's what teenagers do. We used to walk hand in hand with a boyfriend and lost her life when a park a block and a half away was closed that should have been open that summer. And that led to a program that's now called Summer Night Lights. Um, community policing is making sure we have safe places and spa safe spaces uh, for young people to be so that they don't fall into a life of crime too. So um, the mayor's race is in March of 2013. But before that, there's going to be election in 2012. Yes. Right? Um, who are you going to vote for president? I'm voting for Barack Obama. Okay. Um, let me ask you about a couple of other things that may be on the ballot in November of 2012. Governor Brown mm -hmm. is proposing an initiative that would increase the tax rate on the wealthy. Are you for that? Uh, so far, it looks like something that will help us out and um, I'm very positively inclined towards it. I think that right now we have, you know, we celebrate Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama so that we're 47th in the nation in per pupil funding. That should not be what we're celebrating, and absolutely we need to have more funding, and I think the, the governor is headed in the right direction, so I most likely will be supporting it. Yeah, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, of which the mayor has four appointees, mm -hmm. a 13-member board, is seriously considering putting an initiative on the ballot to extend measure, measure R, that's the half cent sales tax to fund uh, um, light rail and other transportation projects. They're not adding to it, they're just saying they're, sure. they would extend the years. Are you in favor of that? Yes, I think I am. Uh, measure R is something I campaigned for very vigorously, that was the half cent sales tax. Unless we invest in our transit infrastructure, you know this west of the 405, it can take two hours from the ocean to the 405 freeway on some days. We absolutely have to give people the options, whether it's rail into LAX, whether it's a Crenshaw line that doesn't just end you know, where it's proposed now, but maybe goes all the way up to Wilshire, looking at not just widening the 405, which in my opinion is like throwing a slightly bigger sponge into the ocean. It's gonna be waterlogged the moment it opens, but actually putting a hole through um, from Sherman Oaks to UCLA um, through the mountain there, which Measure R had. We will need to fund these things, and we, there's not enough money just with Measure R as it is. Um, LA Unified is um, thinking about putting an initiative that would call for an additional $298 a year parcel tax to fund the operations of LAUSD. This is not to build more schools, right. but just to fund um, what's going on. Are you in favor of that? I th they still have to make the case to me. Um, they have to make the case that, that they are going to spend it well, uh, that it, there's no question that they're facing immensely difficult decisions. Cut adult ed completely, cut arts ed completely, cut early ed completely, all of which are critical uh, to our future. But I want to make sure that they're spending it the right way. What I don't like in general is that we're very willing to build buildings and we're not willing to actually fund the people in them. And so their best argument to me is now that we've built 100 plus new schools here, it's the equivalent of taking San Diego's entire school system and plopping it down on top of a school system here that hadn't built a school when I first ran since I had been born 30 years earlier. Um, we need to make sure that we don't just build these buildings but actually put people in them. So, um, but they need to make that case to me a little stronger. Also appearing on the ballot may be a statewide bond measure for $11 billion to overhaul the state's water system. For or against? I, I want to look exactly at what they're doing. Um, I think right now, putting people back to work and investing in our infrastructure in the state in general are very strong principles for me. We used to, I just saw a movie about Pat Brown, and we talked about building the, what was then not just the largest infrastructure pro project in the state or the country, but the world when we did the California Aqueduct. We used to think big in California, and we've stopped doing that. So again, I think our water reform we talked about for about two decades, and most likely we'll be supporting it, but I also want to see the final project. Uh, Pat Brown was, of course, governor of California yep. from 1958 to 1966, defeated by Ronald Reagan. That's right. But uh, his son is currently the governor, right. and of course we always talk about the first Pat Brown as being the great builder, not only yep. of aqueducts, but the, the university, the freeways, et cetera. Um, on the ballot, well, there's currently a um, circulating for signatures, an initiative that goes by the name of COPA, 
uh, which stands for the California Opportunity and Prosperity Act. And let me read you this to be uh, precise. It would decriminalize foreign workers without papers if they pay state taxes, know or are learning English, do not have felony convictions or are suspected terrorists, are not a public charge, and have lived in California since before January 1st, 2008. So uh, would you vote for that? I'm very positively inclined towards it. You know, my own family experience that I mentioned to you, I mean, on my father's side, my grandfather came here when he was one year old, um, when he lost his father during the Mexican Revolution, and my great-grandmother carried him over the border. Um, he earned his citizenship by fighting in World War II. And the more we can mainstream our, citizens, our, our residents into citizenship, the better we all will be. It's part of the reason that some of the things I've done that have been the more risky um, very much fit into my own family background. For instance, here in the city of Los Angeles, we now recognize matricula cards, or matricula consular cards, they're called, which the consul generals, the consulates here, issue so that people can have a form of ID and we know who they are. They can feel safe going into a library. They can report a crime. It helps mainstream. And I'd love to see you know, folks paying taxes that are not. I'd love to see people having a pathway to citizenship that are not. And I don't think we're powerless in the state. We don't just have to wait for the federal government to show what America is about. America was built on immigrants coming to this country, and we have to get back to remembering that as an American value. So um, Occupy LA. Mm -hmm. um, they occupied the lawn of City Hall. They did. Um, <laughs> so what, what was your reaction to the, that whole movement, and particularly how it manifested itself in Los Angeles? Well, you know, I went out there the first day um, because I think the frustration that I feel long before any occupiers came to City Hall is that there's too many people out of work, there's too many people returning. I'm, I myself I serve in the United States Navy as a, an officer in the reserve component. I have folks that I know coming back from wars that can't find jobs. College graduates, as many of you will unfortunately experience, who themselves can't find work. Teachers who have been laid off. And those were some of the very first people I met on the northern lawn of uh, City Hall. And I think the movement was very successful in painting you know, and showing in this country just how polarized we're becoming in terms of income distribution. That's not healthy for democracy. It was always the middle class in the United States that was the buttress of, of prosperity. It was the pathway to allowing people to have those opportunities. Um, you know, I think it was handled well over time. And if you talk to even the folks that were there, there were health issues that came up, killing of the grass. I think they were successful in what they set out to do. What I said is now it's time to stop occupying and it's time to start participating inside. And when folks came in, for instance, looking at the housing crisis, they didn't realize that we were doing a lot of things on that. You know, they thought that occupying City Hall is the first time they were going to bring this to our attention. And I said, actually, there's four or five pieces of legislation that I've written, keeping people in their homes, punishing banks who don't keep up their foreclosed property, um, making it illegal for evictions of foreclosed homes when the renters are paying their rent on time, as was happening. And they said, that's great. Now work with us on all these folks who are losing their homes. And so I think it's really become much more of a collaboration now rather than just an occupation. On April 5th, the um, AEG, the Anschutz Entertainment Group that built Staples Center and LA Live is about to release its EIR, the Environmental Impact Report on the proposed football stadium. Um, Loyola Marymount University conducted a poll of 1,600 LA residents and we asked them whether they support the idea of football or not, and they were supportive of the idea of football. When we pressed them about shortening the EIR, they weren't too sure about that. They were somewhat concerned. And then when we pressed them about financing or having public financing for the movement of the convention center, not the actual building of the football sure. stadium, there were also some concerns about yeah. that. What's your position on, on the football stadium, the EIR, the public financing, and all that stuff? And we have how much time left for the whole? Yeah, OK. okay. Just, I'll give you two oh, minutes on that one. All right, two minutes on it. All right, so I'll, I'll go quick. You know, if this was just a football deal, for me, I mean, as a football fan, it would be great. I, I want us to have a football team. Uh, but as a by the way, which one? Um, I would love the Rams back. Crime has gone down every single year since the Raiders left, so I don't think we need them back. Okay. But uh, <laughs> sorry for any Raiders fans. But we, for, for me, this is interesting not as a football deal. Because while that's great and there's construction jobs up front, football stadiums generally don't have a lot of full-time jobs. And certainly any public financing to build that is a mistake. And any municipalities and counties that have done that have paid out of the, their general funds over time in a way that's destructive to our basic services. And I oppose that. The city's opposed it for a long time. And we've negotiated what would be the, only the second stadium ever built in the United States without taxpayer subsidy, the other being the Meadowlands for the New York area. New York and LA can sustain that sort of a uh, hard bargain. 
Um, what we have done, though, that makes this more interesting, and I'll use props here for everybody, is right now we have, if, if up here is the Staples Center downtown, we have a, a, what's called the West Hall and a South Hall. They don't touch each other. And in the convention business, we're the second biggest city in America, but we only have right now a convention center that's 15th in terms of its bookings. And these are good jobs, hotels that get built around them, et cetera. When we built LA Live, um, the JW Marriott and the Ritz-Carlton, we went from 30th to 15th. And a lot of people criticize us ahead of time, don't do that, but it produced a lot of permanent jobs and rocketed us up the ratings. But we should be in the top five. So here's where it gets interesting. Right now, a lot of people don't book conventions, A, because there's not enough hotels downtown, and B, because these two buildings don't touch each other, which is kind of a strange thing, right? But I talked to a lot of, of um, convention bookers, and they said they want contiguous space. In other words, buildings that touch each other, and they don't today. So under this plan, this building comes down, and we build it here. So now we have contiguous space, and then the stadium gets built back where the old hall was. And the stadium turns into convention space when it's not being used for football games. So we've now got a convention center 50% bigger, and it now is all contiguous space. Under that, a lot of the projections show that we probably would have four or five hotels that would get built around that. That would be thousands then of permanent new jobs, and we'd probably be in the top five in terms of convention bookings. We have to do that with our convention center anyway. The football stadium is built with none of our taxpayer money. And the convention center thing, which we'd have to pay for 100% with taxpayer money if we didn't have this deal, 75% of it gets paid for by AEG, and 25% gets paid for by new economic growth that happens on site. So in other words, not taking out of a current library, police station, or fire station. So if they can get a football team now, we have driven a very hard bargain. To mix my metaphors, we played hardball with them, and we've done a good deal for the, the citizenry of Los Angeles. So if they can get that done, it would be great. The EIR, which you also mentioned about, um, I don't think we should waive any of our environmental impact report um, um, requirements, and there are none. Right. But what happens is if somebody appeals it, we're trying to compress the amount of time that appeals take. And I am supportive of that, not just for a big deal like the convention center in Hollywood. We had a couple projects that people almost unanimously were for, but one or two people in the neighborhood opposed, sued, and that went on for two years sometimes. They lost all the way up to the California State Supreme Court, but guess what? Because it took two years, the deal fell apart. Mm -hmm. Those jobs, you know, it's still an empty lot there, et cetera. So I think that that is a healthy thing for us to have. Okay, I'm totally convinced. Sure. I'm for the football stadium. I want it built. I believe the way the structure, mm -hmm. that, that it's good for um, Los Angeles, it's good for the convention center. Mm -hmm. Everything you said, I'm totally convinced. Yet, when we explain this to people, they're still not completely convinced. What do you think is going on there? Why are people so skeptical? about that. I think you, people are skeptical for good reason, and I was skeptical. I still am skeptical till I see the final deal of what they're going to do on their EIR. Um, we want to make sure there's not additional traffic downtown. We want to use this as a moment to actually make all our rail lines link downtown, so you can go straight all the way to Union Station. You can come from Pasadena. You can come from West LA. Now with the Expo line, you can come from South LA and actually conveniently get there. We want that to happen. But I also think people have seen around the country that a lot of cities have been sold a bill of goods where billionaires come in, say, build me a stadium, and we're subsidizing them, and it comes out of regular people's pockets in the end. We have constructed a wall around that. So LA has is, is learned those lessons, but I understand that skepticism because people look around the country and they say, you know, I've seen it happen before, I wanna make sure it doesn't happen here. Okay, we are in a classroom, university setting. Before you deviated your career path, you were teaching at Occidental College, working on a dissertation about to become uh, a professor, which is an excellent career choice. Um, and then, then you deviate it. Um, but now I'm giving you the opportunity to give out grades. So using the traditional academic scale, A, B, C, D, and F, uh, how would you grade uh, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa? You know, I think he's taken a lot of different classes, and in some of them there's been straight A's, and some classes that people don't even know he's taken. Um, work that he's done that people don't recognize, changing how we do our workforce development, um, things on the environment, et cetera. And there's other places where I think he would be the first to probably grade himself and say it's incomplete right now, um, where we have had a lot of the groundwork laid, but not the implementation of some of the things that our city needs. Um, so I think it would have to be, you know, issue by issue to give something overall to the mayor. I've really enjoyed working with him. I think he's been a, a good spokesperson for the city, but now we need the follow through and the implementation of a lot of what he's queued up. Is that a C? I, I, it is exactly what I said. He's incomplete in certain areas, and I'll give him some very good marks in others. Okay, Governor Jerry Brown, A, B, C, D, or F? 
you know, it's tough one grade because I think what he's done and what he's trying to do, he gets an A for. He certainly gets an A for effort. I think he's been tone perfect. I think he's crossed over, not just being an ideologue, but looking for practical um, stuff. But in terms of what we've actually produced, I would give Sacramento collectively right now at best maybe a C because nothing is changing. When, when people ask me why I want to run for mayor, I look at the Sacramento level and the Washington level and I wonder if this country and the state are capable of ever solving our problems. But I know at the local level you can get things done. It's part of the reason when I look up there, they have such a low grade in my mind because the rules are so broken. But he's doing, I think, a, a heck of a job in the midst of a broken system. Uh, President Barack Obama. So full disclosure, I was President Obama's uh, Southern California chairman, one of his national co-chairs, and you know, went around the country. I, um, I'm very close with him and, and uh, believe a lot in, in uh, who he is and what he's done. I think it's been, again, an immensely difficult context. He inherited more uh, difficulties than any president in modern history, certainly since FDR. Two wars, broken economy, um, you know, downward spiral, uh, banks about to go bankrupt, et cetera. Uh, in that context, I would say he is, he's in the A category, B plus, A minus. And certainly in his, in his willingness to cross over party lines and compromise, I would give him an A. But it's now shown us that he had to show people that he was willing to do that and that the other side just has absolutely not been able to do that. And so now I think he's headed towards a much stronger path of saying, look, if you won't collaborate with me, I'm going to stand up for the things that I believe in. Um, and I think he's done some incredibly important things, ending the war, you know, promoting equal rights, um, making sure that we have job growth, which we've seen every single month, basically, since, the, since I think month eight in his uh, administration. Police Chief Charlie Beck. Uh, Char Charlie Beck, I think we covered that before. He's done you know, an, an excellent job. I think he has the right temperament. Um, he, I like that he's a low-key guy. Um, he doesn't need to be right there in front of the cameras. I, I was very close with Chief Bratton, too, who had a completely different style. But I'd give, uh, I'd give Charlie an A-. Okay. Um, LA County Sheriff Lee Baca? Lee is, uh, you know, he certainly had a tough uh, curriculum this year. <laughs> he's had some tough classes, I would say. And I think a lot of people from the outside um, are questioning his abilities. Um, that said, I can't think of a better reformer for turning around what's wrong right now with our, school, our, our jails. He is probably one of the most forward-thinking law enforcement officials we have in the country. Um, and I think when I've seen him, what I've seen him do to the culture of the sheriff's department has been an A. Right now he's facing, I mean, I would say it's probably midway. He could, he could have an F this year for the first time in a, in a given area. But I, but I have a lot of faith in the man. And I think that he can turn around to a pretty good grade. Uh, District Attorney Steve Cooley. Um, you know, Cooley, Cooley's done a pretty decent job. I give him a, I give him a B. Okay. No, he he did beat your dad. He though. did, so I think it's pretty fair. I give him okay. a B. All right. <laughs> uh, um, uh, LAUSD Superintendent John Daisy. John Daisy, again, it's way too early. If, if we're keep continuing the metaphor, he's like in week two of his class. But so far, the yeah, first by couple. Second week, I already know what most of the students are going to get. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Remember that. Um, I would say so far he's, he's done great. He's got an A on the first couple exams, and he's got his work cut out for him, for sure. Uh, Miguel Santana, the Chief Administrative Officer of the city. Um, I hate to, be, to come across as an easy professor here. I worked very closely with Miguel, and I would say that he's done a very good job um, in the toughest times. I worked very closely with him. Four years ago, the city was facing bankruptcy, facing bankruptcy. And the work that we've done, that I negotiated, that he's helped me do, we negotiated a half billion dollars of pension reform, health care reform to a level we've never seen. I mean, he's definitely in a, a territory as well. And City Attorney Carmen Trutanich? Uh, Carmen Trutanich uh, is, uh, for the first time, for those of you who follow city politics, the city attorney is supposed to treat the city as his client. And for the first time, I do feel like we have a city attorney who's treating both the people of LA and the city council like his client. He's done extraordinary work, whether it's on illegal billboards, uh, whether it's going after some of our toughest uh, cases. Um, I, I am very satisfied with the work that he's done. I'd definitely put him in the A-minus category, too. And, then, and finally, uh, the Los Angeles City Council. Uh, as a body? As a body. Um, you know, we, we're not for the council. It, you, you can't ask me to grade myself. <laughs> Um, but I serve on it. I think that's yeah, always I a dangerous I fill out thing. all my student evaluations. Do you? you know, yeah. You're good. So. That's why you get such high marks. Exactly. Um, this city council saved the city from bankruptcy. It has tackled some of the largest uh, issues. I would say second maybe just to Atlanta in this country. We have done more to face up to the financial crisis and fiscal crisis that we faced than any other city. I think because it is a body filled with many different people, it will never be uh, like any legislative body a straight A. 
but I would say it's a strong B plus in terms of what we have done. Um, it's a collection of a lot of different personalities, a lot of egos, a lot of issues. Um, but given that, I think we've been a lot more functional than most legislative bodies okay. when I compare myself. So explain to the students what the job of the council president is and how it differs from other council members. So city council president, is, so the council themselves elect a city council president, so you don't run citywide. Um, so that means with 15 members, eight people can make you president. And at any given time, eight people can put a motion in and a week later take you out as council president. Oh, so it takes a week. Uh -huh. You get a week notice, you know, yeah. you can't just be done that, that day. They get a little time to think it through. Mm -hmm. and, and as I mentioned, I got elected four times in, in our kind of um, uh, post-term limits era, the most that anybody's ever been elected council president. I joke that it's not really the right job title. It's not council president. It's group therapist. Because what you have to do is figure out what makes people tick. For one person, it might be their ego and they need recognition of something. For somebody else, it might be an intense belief in a given issue and wanting to make sure that that issue doesn't get lost. For somebody else, they just want to be included and feel a part of the group. And for somebody else, you know, they may have political aspirations and you have to frame it in what they need. What was fascinating, what I loved about the job, and what I ultimately think will make me successful as mayor, is in this city, not just with the city council and mayor, but this county where we have so many different cities together, if you're not strong enough to lead, in, in other words, for a group of people set out the vision of where we need to go, but also humble enough to listen. You know, if you just do the first and say, we're going here, you might look behind you and only have three people. If you just spend all day long listening to them, you might never move. But what we were able to do and what I did as council president was take a group of 15 individuals and lead them towards legislation, towards a budget, which we balanced every single year, towards consensus hand in hand with the mayor to make sure that we were able to actually do the people's business. And it is very different than being, for instance, Speaker of the House of Representatives or Speaker of the California State Assembly. That you can hand out favors, punish people who, you know, step out and are disobedient. I mean, that is much more top down. This is kind of like a horizontal leader. You're the first among equals, but you're all still equals. But you don't really you get can, more you, staff. But you or can bigger. punish uh, a council member if... It quickly turns on you. You but can. you could. You could. And so what would be the method of punishing a council member? Well, you appoint people to what committees they chair. So, you know, folks who get a less good committee, that could be seen as a form of punishment. Uh, people who have legislation that they're trying to pass and you can work to defeat that, uh, that would be a form of, of punishment. But everybody, you know, unlike Sacramento, you might hear stories where if somebody steps, uh, you know, angers the speaker, they get put into a different office and it's the size of a closet. Things like that don't exist at City Hall. We all have equal staffs, equal offices. Um, there, are, there are ways of reminding, but if you do punish, you have to be very careful because two or three people, and if, if people begin to feel like you're that sort of a leader, you won't stay council president very long. Um, part of it is also, the, the, you talk about the committee system. How important is the committee system to running the city council? It's very important. Every, every council member chairs one committee. So there's 15 committees then? 15 committees. And, um, you know, for instance, when I first uh, became council member, and as I mentioned, I helped a friend of mine, Alex Padilla, become president, he said, you can have any committee you want. And so usually the ones that people would have sought out are budget and finance, public safety, our planning and land use management, which is how, where things get built and all the development in the city. But I sought housing, community, and economic development when I had my pick of all of them. Because for me, my district was the third poorest of 15 council districts. The average person in it earned $23,000. We were the most overcrowded. We had the fewest park spaces. We had a high level of poverty and crime. And that's why I ran for office, to change that. And so, you know, it was critical, the work that I did at the committee level. By the time it gets to the city council, we have so many things every week that we vote on, maybe more than 100 items. It, if it isn't worked out, there's only two or three that you can really have a long debate about and still continue the people's business. So most of the work and the forming of new laws and new directions for the city happens at that committee level. So you have taken thousands of votes in your 11, 12 year uh, council history. Is there one vote that sticks in your mind that you regret, you wish if in retrospect you had voted the other way, that you've now found information that you didn't have then, or it just didn't turn out the way you expected. What would, what would that vote be? You know, I don't really have many that I regret. Um, there's one that I can remember I learned a lesson that was very important when we voted on settlement for, uh, there was a lawsuit from the billboard companies against the city of Los Angeles. And it was this thick, and we get a summary of it, and our city attorney, who we depend on and rely on, says this is a good deal, move forward. 
And, and you have to trust, whether it's your own staff, whether it's somebody who from, is from your legislative analyst office, your city attorney, or one of our departments, giving you advice about where to move. We didn't see in the fine print there that one of the things that billboard companies could do was convert billboards from regular billboards to electronic billboards. And um, for folks who live close to electronic billboards, they're very distracting, they're very bright, they're in people's homes. Um, and that was one way, it was like, I don't care how thick the, the packet is, it's ultimately your vote. You will be held accountable for that. And make sure you ask the questions ahead of time and try to read as much of the fine print as you can. We are at Loyola Marymount University having a conversation with Council Member Eric Garcetti, also candidate for mayor. Um, when you think about running for mayor, is it an advantage or disadvantage that you are a sitting council member? For me, I, th I think it's an advantage. I mean, I've been able, I think a lot of people think for government, you know, if you train to be a doctor, train to be a lawyer, a pilot, you learn your profession and people know that. They, you want to go to a doctor who's probably had five, ten years of experience rather than somebody who's just coming in new. And you see in politics a lot of times people saying, oh, I've been successful doing this other thing. Trust me and let me come in. Having been a council member, I know how City Hall works. I know the personalities. I know that I would be the mayor to have the best relationship with the city council probably in modern history, which is important to get your stuff done. Um, I understand where our city departments work and how they don't, who I'd want to get rid of and who I'd want to bring in. Understanding that is so critical. And I think, you know, I don't know how many of you read, there's a great book called Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell, about success. It's a really good, quick read if you haven't read it. And it looks at the myth that somehow sometimes people are just born as geniuses and that you're just successful because it's in there. And they talked in one story about Mozart, how the myth is that Mozart, when he was six years old, was writing incredible songs. And when you actually look at it, when he was five or six, he was writing pretty bad songs or seven. It wasn't until he had had about 10,000 hours, which is kind of the threshold of work doing that, that he suddenly blossomed as a composer. And the same thing at City Hall. I've seen great politicians come into City Hall who haven't been at City Hall recently or who had only worked at another level. Um, even Mayor Villaraigosa admitted to me, you know, it took him a couple years to figure things out. As a council member, I think it's a strong advantage to have somebody who will be a steward of the city who can hit the ground running July 1st, 2013 who has the program, the agenda, the experience, and can point to it. And in the meantime, not just talk about the things I want to do, but many of the things we can talk about today, I'm doing. If somebody gives me a great idea, one of the students here at LMU gives me a great idea for something, I could actually introduce a resolution on it tomorrow, and the next 15 months, year and a half that I have as a city council member, that might be made a law by the time I'm even mayor. So I think I look at it as an important qualification, a strong advantage, and something that uh, has a proven track record. So if you were running against Eric Garcetti, what would be his weakness in terms of the campaign and the strategy? I don't know. I, I'll leave that to my opponents. I mean, I'll tell you what I would say for me is that the kind of leadership style I have is strong enough to set out a vision, but also able to bring together all the players around. I mean, sometimes that people will hunger for a kind of strength that is about beating your chest. Mm -hmm. And to me, if you look at the failure in government today, it's that there's too much of that and not enough practical tenacity. To me, toughness is about actually sticking to a problem and grinding it out. When we faced a budget crisis, I could have gotten on you know, a podium like that and held a press conference and said, we need our unions to give us give backs. We just saw it in the news you know, last week. We're going to lay more people off according to what the mayor said. My style is to actually go with those unions and say, look, I have a lot of respect for you. I know you have a lot of respect for me, but I'm closing these doors. You can go home at night but otherwise you're staying in here until we negotiate a settlement, as I did you know, during, during this budget crisis. And to me, that is much stronger. So I don't know what the criticism would be in. I've heard mm -hmm. those sorts of things like, oh, is he too thoughtful? Um, you know, does yeah, he we, we wouldn't enough? want a mayor who thinks. Exactly, but to me, you know, I, I don't want just somebody who's a cerebral, though, either. I mean, for me, I'm in this to get things done. You, know, you don't turn around neighborhoods like the ones that I've had in the heart of the city that have had just phenomenal turnarounds in Silver Lake, Hollywood, which for 30 years was about to have a turnaround, and now is one of the safest places in the city, has the most economic activity, um, you know, is roaring back and something we can finally be proud of without being tough. It's just a different sort of effectiveness, and I think that, you know, as you all look at what you want, you can go to places like Ohio um, or Wisconsin where you have governors who are, you know, beating their chest, but what do they actually produce at the end of the day? Walkouts, lockouts, to me that's failure. Success is getting the job done. So when I think about Los Angeles in the last 20 years, <clears throat> it's become more democratic. Mm -hmm. Only 18% of registered voters are now mm -hmm. uh, Republican. 
so very democratic. You're a democratic, mm -hmm. very liberal. Mm -hmm. It's become much more environmental. Mm -hmm. Okay, you are em environmentalist, one of the leaders of the mm -hmm. environmental movement in Los Angeles. It's become, um, you know, much more labor friendly. Um, you are associated with the labor movement, and they've been big time supporters of yours. Um, it's become much more Latino. Mm -hmm. So when I think about that, more Latino, more labor, more democratic, more environmentalist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you should like win very easily. Okay, from your lips to the voters' yeah. ears. Okay, but what? Uh, oh. But. Why is the sense that this is going to be a very competitive election with some individuals who don't meet those four categories? And when I think about the change of Los Angeles, those are some of the four major ones. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have, I have no doubt that those things are going to help me. But I also have no doubt, just as like I experienced in that first campaign when I mentioned to all of you what it was like at those doors, mm -hmm. people will vote not based on your resume, <clears throat> though they want to know you're qualified. They won't even vote necessarily on your platform, though they, know, they want to know you have good ideas. And they won't vote just on what you've done, though they want to see that you've been effective. What they will vote on is the feeling they have about you. Those things may give you an advantage, may give, open the door, but you have to close that deal yourself. You have to inspire people that the best days of this city are yet to come. You have to show them what that vision looks like so that LA is poised for the growth of the new economy, so that we have LAUSD kids who are graduating learning not just the most important language here, Spanish, but the second most important language, computer coding, so that when uh, YouTube invests $250 million in Playa Vista, because 90% of the internet will be video soon, and LA is poised to take advantage of that much more than Silicon Valley or other places, that you can actually sell this city and attract those companies. They want to know that you care about you know, sustainability, not that just you have a good environmental record, but for me that you know, I took a district that was one of the park poorest in Los Angeles with 13 parks, and we just opened up our 38th park. We nearly tripled, and we will because we have two more on tap, triple the number of parks in the smallest district in the city of LA. And most of all, they want to know who are you? What's your story? What's your vision? Do you have an optimistic, uh, a vision of where this city is headed, or are you just throwing stones at the institutions mm -hmm. and saying what's wrong with City Hall? So I certainly embrace those parts of who I am, being Latino, being also Jewish, being an environmentalist, working closely with labor, but they also want to know that you're going to stand up and do things practically. I'm a Democrat, but I'll just say one, one last thing. Mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat and proud of that, but you know what this job teaches you? It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. Is a pothole a Democratic or Republican issue? Is a park a Democratic or Republican issue? You have to solve people's problems, and they judge you ultimately on your ability to do that. And it makes you a pretty proud nonpartisan as well. Oye, este, eres Latino porque no te ves como Latino, y tu apellido no es Latino. Mi apellido es italiano al lado de mi padre, pero mi familia es de México. Mis abuelos fue nacido en Chihuahua y Sonora. Tengo mucho orgullo de mi nacimiento, de mi familia también, y es un es un parte de de mí, un parte de la ciudad, and necesitamos uh, tener la, uh, este, este actitud a uh, uh, ser un líder en la nueva Los Ángeles. You know, everybody wants to be Latino nowadays, so it's... Uh, <laughs> Good so, thing that I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when, when you, one of the criticisms... I'll translate for everybody who's yeah. Spanish impaired if they want to hear. Um, people talk about you being too closely tied to labor. When you hear that criticism, how do you respond and what do they mean by that? Uh, I don't know what they mean. I'll, I'll leave that up to the folks who would make that criticism. I'm certainly very proud. I mean, I wouldn't be here were it not for unions and for labor. My grandmother, who was a meat packer, my grandfather, who was a barber, were both union members. My grandfather on my mom's side was a small business owner who uh, built up an amazing apparel company, men's apparel company, and he had a union shop and was very proud of that. Um, but I think People need to judge not only my closeness to working men and women. I mean, I want people to be able to support their families, have good benefits. That often happens much more with union jobs than not. And if we don't have those, we all pay the price. Emergency room visits, health care that doesn't exist, low-wage jobs where people can't support themselves. But I've also been able to stand up in moments of crisis, you know, to sit down, as I mentioned, with our city unions. And, and even if that means risking some of my, you know, the easiest thing would have been to write an extra zero and say, look, the budget's balanced. I'm with you 100%. But we did, uh, that's not respectful in my mind. You actually sit down with folks and say, we have real problems, we'll solve these together. And what I did with the unions, when we negotiated the city unions, these contracts, the half billion dollars of pension reform, the health care reform, 
downsizing our workforce by 4,000 people in a year and a half, which is no easy feat. I didn't leave them by themselves. I went to those ratification meetings because a union leader can negotiate, but then they have to take it to their people to ratify. And you know, it's a tough time to be a union leader, just it's like a tough time to be an elected official. They can be voted out of office as well. And I said, I will be the city official who gives the respect to the city workers and tell them why we need to do this. And we got 97% of the unions to ratify it because I showed up and had a human face there. Stood my ground, though. So if somebody says, you know, you're not tough enough, I didn't see, you know, folks who were anti-union delivering that sort of reform. But I think you do that better hand in hand than, it, than by demonizing people. So when you start thinking about the field of candidates for mayor, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, city mm -hmm. controller Wendy Gruel, mm -hmm. uh, councilwoman Jan Perry, mm -hmm. Um, investment banker, former deputy mayor uh, Austin Butner, mm -hmm. uh, radio personality, U.S. former U.S. attorney Kevin James, and then of course Stev Yaroslavsky, mm -hmm. who hasn't at this moment um, uh, uh, declared himself as a candidate, but I fully expect him to be a candidate. Um, you know, with the exception of Kevin James, who is a registered Republican. Um, I think Austin Butner is a decline to state. Correct. But the other four of you are, are Democrats, are um, somewhat friendly to labor. How do you, what differentiates you amongst those four? Leaving Kevin James and Austin Butner out of this for a second, just because they, uh, of the, the fact that they are not currently elected officials, and one's a Republican, one's a decline to state. These four Democrats, these four who would all call themselves environmentalists, pro-labor, all this kind of stuff. How can a voter tell the difference between you, Wendy, Sev, and Jen? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that's unique to me and my candidacy is the track record that I have. I mean, I took what was, if, this, if the body of L.A., like we were talking about 20 years mm -hmm. ago, was sick, the heart of L.A. was in need of a triple bypass. I mean, 12 years ago, we tell people, you wanted to meet him in an alleyway in Hollywood, something bad was going to happen. Now it's to you know, dine out and to have a, a pleasant <clears throat> evening. It's a place where we've shown how to put jobs and housing together. So we build something like a W Hotel, but just behind it, 25% of the apartments are affordable to low-income uh, residents so that a housekeeper at the W Hotel can go home to her daughter instead of driving from the Inland Empire, cause us all traffic and pollution and have no quality of life. Um, that track record is, and I didn't do it myself, we did it hand in hand with partnerships in the communities, it has been just a remarkable turnaround. We have people from around the country and the world who come and say, how did you do this in these neighborhoods? How did you show us kind of a new vision of LA? That's one. Two, you know, I have executive experience. I've been acting mayor. I understand how this city works. And I also have relationships around. I'd like to, as mayor, not just be a mayor for Los Angeles, but for the region of LA. I want to bring the, the mayors of Beverly Hills and Riverside and Ventura and uh, Seal Beach and all around here together a few times a year because we're really talking about planning a common future. And you know, a mayor, a friend of mine who's supporting me in a neighboring community said recently, you know, we love to hate LA because you're the 800 pound gorilla that never listens. But if you stopped and listened, we would follow. So I want to be also somebody who has that executive experience and the right leadership style to actually get things done. And then I think third, I, one of the reasons I jumped into this race is I didn't see a lot of positive, hopeful vision out there. I heard a lot of criticisms, and I can tell you what's wrong with City Hall. I can tell you what I want to reform there, bring a ratepayer advocate to the DWP so that our water and power bills have somebody on our side looking at those rates. I can tell you the things that I fix every single day, but criticism is not a vision. To throw stones at the place that you want to live, it's like burning down the house you want to live in. I want to fire you up. I want you to feel excited. I want LA to be buzzworthy in the world again. I want this to be a place where people want to plant their family and their new business. I want it to be a place where there's jobs for new graduates from high school and for college. I want to see an airport that is world class. I want to see a rail link that gets in there and a public transit system that works. I want to see us reducing traffic and celebrating this city, whether it's like Sikh Via, which if you've not been to, uh, in two weeks, we're gonna, or in one week, we're gonna be doing that April 15th, where we closed down 10 miles of roads to cars and we had 150,000 bicyclists out there falling in love with the city all over again because there's a band playing there and street chess and dodgeball and yoga and cookout. You know, LA is the best canvas in the world to paint on. And what will distinguish my campaign is I'm going to give us a way not only to see that vision, but I'm going to invite you all in to be a part of it. Because I'm not looking for just a group of people who will vote for me or support my campaign, though I hope that you will. And I will never miss an opportunity. This is the formal ask. I hope that if you're registered to vote here, I would love your support. But I want you to be with me after I'm there. 
I want you to be part of a new civic fabric that doesn't exist in Los Angeles very much. We have people who come here as national politicians asking us for money. We get email appeals from people and we answer the call. A friend asked us for a specific cause to help us, you know, with a humane society or an environmental cause, and we answer that too. But how often are you asked to do something for your city? And I want to ask that of you and invite you in and, and figure out a way that you can turn a school, a neighborhood, a park around, make this economy boom, and that's what's going to make this campaign different than any of the others. What, um, when you think about the city in the next 10, 15 years, what do you imagine? You know, I imagine LA as a center of innovation and creativity. I, I, I see us as a place where the next explosion in the new economy and in technology brings Silicon Valley and Hollywood together, where we take international trade and all the advantages we have by having 37 countries that have their largest populations outside their home country coming here because there's money being invested from Latin America and Asia and from around the United States because people know this is the crossroads of the world where the eastern capital of the uh, Asian Pacific Rim, the northern capital of Latin America, the western capital of the United States. I also see it as a more just city, a place where our schools actually prepare people for those jobs, give young people a place to play in their neighborhood and a good education right there with after school programs, good facilities and links to local industry. And lastly, I see a city that is proud of itself. You know, somebody asked me, it's 20, Bob Hertzberg used to be the assembly speaker. He said, it's 2021. He's a very blunt guy. He speaks directly. 2021, Garcetti, it's your last month in office. What's the banner headline of the LA Times say about your time in office? And instead of saying that we improved traffic, which we will, and got our economy back on track, which we will, instead of saying we built 100 parks, which we can and will, it said LA is great again. And people believed in it. That's so Michael. Was he hugging you at the same time? That he, he did asking? not hug me that time. <laughs> <laughs> He's a we, notorious hugger. Yeah. We are at Loyola Marymount University talking to Eric Garcetti, council member and candidate for mayor. We got all kinds of things to still talk about. Redevelopment, redistricting, education, the fire department, the Coliseum, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, if there's any student who wants to ask a question, uh, make your way over here and we can ask a question of the uh, council member uh, mayoral candidate. Um, when, when redistricting process happened, what was your goal for your particular district, the 13th, and then for the city a as a whole? So every 10 years we have to redistrict because the census tells us how many people live here and by law each of the council districts has to be the same size. So we um, went through that process to make sure that the right size. My goal for my own district was to keep some of the ties to the communities that I'm working with together to be able to finish the work out that I've done with them and to make sure that communities as close as we could were kept whole and not chopped into pieces unless, and some communities like this, they, sometimes they like having two council members or three council members because they think it, it strengthens their power. Outside of my district, it was to see all of Koreatown unified into one district, which we were able to achieve uh, for the first time, um, to make sure that we had communities in the valley, South LA, with their strong opportunity districts for people of color to continue to run for office, and to make sure that we had a city that had as logical districts as possible. So looking at our neighborhood councils to have as many communities united in single districts as possible. Um, were you happy with the outcome? Yes, generally. I mean, you I mean, voted there's, for there's it. Always, yeah, I voted for it. There's always difficult things that happen in it, and, there, and this was no exception. You know, sometimes there's people who get moved or lose well, this asset Jan or the Jan other. Perry was here last week. She no. wasn't happy. No, I, I know she was not. I mean, it's tough downtown. has three council districts that border it. Only two of them share any part of it. You know, Ed Reyes, which is, who has a district very close in Pico Union, for instance, the Staples Center and gets a lot of the blowback, doesn't have any of downtown. Um, she has less of downtown now, though she has some of it, and Jose Wezar has more of it. But in general, when I look citywide, I was generally pleased. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Melanie. Um, I actually live in your um, district. Where about? Um, East Hollywood. Excellent. And I just want to thank you for repaving my road and fixing the potholes. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so my question today is, um, now that the responsible banking ordinance was passed by City Council, yeah. how will that benefit local communities and will it deter financial institutions in developing public slash private partnerships with the city? That's great. By the way, I, I always say you can't, uh, you can't lift your eyes up to the stars unless you fix the cracks on the sidewalk. And I do believe that our work, we can talk about grand policy things, but my job number one is to make sure that we have paved streets, fixed sidewalks, et cetera, which is tough to do in a city that's neglected it for 50 years, but we've put that emphasis there. 
Um, the responsible banking ordinance is something that we looked at doing after we saw the downturn in 2008 of the economy, much of it caused by the foreclosure crisis and the links to a lot of banks that we bailed out who still are, in my opinion, not doing enough to keep people in their homes. And there's another bubble waiting to pop here if we don't take this seriously. And I took this very seriously even before the downturn in 2007. We established a hotline as we began to see people foreclosing on, on individuals' homes that people could go on and renegotiate with a bank the terms of their mortgage to keep those homes there, which was a very practical thing. It wasn't just that people need to be saved, but if somebody loses their home, a whole street goes down the tubes. And um, unfortunately, 2008 came and crashed like a tidal wave, but that hotline we established, we still launched it in English and Spanish. Over a half billion dollars of homes have been saved, and 100,000 people are still in their homes today because we set that up. Didn't stop everything from happening, but certainly helped. And now I want to see that your money that you pay in taxes, that we put in banks, goes to those banks that are doing a good job, putting people and keeping people in their homes. Uh, we have, for instance, a lot of work we've done with certain banks when we hear somebody who's about to lose their home, who's been paying on time, or is told one day to pay, another day not to. I mean, it's pretty crazy out there. There is people that make so much money off the foreclosure. There's a whole culture right now that encourages foreclosures to happen, rather than a culture to save people's homes. You know, because it's not even the banks, it's some of the people working with the banks that they hire. Who, it's just like the good old days when all these people got homes, they made money off of really easy mortgages that then they didn't even have any responsibility for. They made their money and went off. Now it's the opposite. They're making money off the foreclosures and going someplace else, destabilizing our communities. So a responsible banking ordinance will allow us to look at who's doing a good job and take city money out of those banks that are doing a bad job and to try to pressure them all to do more to keep people in their homes um, by saying, look, I'm not saying specific banks, but if Wells Fargo is doing a great job, way to go, Wells. Why aren't you doing that at Bank of America? So, Thank you. Um, there were some discussions about having mayoral debates. Um, what do you think about mayoral debates? I think they're great. I think, you know, when you look at 4 million people that live in this city, the number of people who will have this experience that you're having, not just with me, but you get all the candidates, which is a great opportunity, it's going to be less than a percent of people who actually see us live. So that means 99% of people will vote mostly based on television ads at the end of the campaign. I love this. I love doing this in, in living rooms. I love doing this in meeting halls. I love doing this in classrooms. Because to me, this is, this is why I've run for office and this is why I'm running for mayor. To be able to actually see people's faces, see their expressions, hear their anger, their happiness, their hopes, their disappointments, and to try to channel that into a, a voice. And I think that debates give you a great chance to see that live, or at least even on TV to be able to see the difference of the candidates and make an informed decision instead of something just based on a couple TV ads. So what's going to happen, of course, is between now and November, the presidential race is going to eat up all of the political attention. And so my instinct is that the mayoral race doesn't really hit up or heat up mm -hmm. until uh, no, the week after the um, uh, presidential election. But then, of course, we immediately have Thanksgiving. Right. Then we go into December and, and, and uh, uh, you know, Christmas and New Year's, and so then really it's a sprint from January, March, yep. and yep. Uh, excuse me, January, February. February. I don't even know my own months in a row. <laughs> like, um, scared me that it was one month. Yeah, two, two months, two, yeah. two real focused months. So, what, what's um, do you agree with that that kind of the, the way that it will unfold? I do. I, I think you're exactly right. I've I've kind of said this is like a triathlon. I mean, last year after I declared, I, I had a swim until the end of the year. This year is like a long bike ride until you get to the end of, of uh, the presidential. And then it's like a, a run. Um, and I think the end of it will be a sprint. Um, but at the same time, even if we had it in November of next year, most people wait until the last couple of weeks to focus on a campaign no matter when it is. Mm -hmm. So I'm a realist about that, and that's OK. But I'm going to do a lot. When you're saying it doesn't heat up till then, I'm heating it up every single day. I'm working seven days a week right now. You know, I go from Woodland Hills to San Pedro. Uh, to Carthay Circle, to Lemur Park, to Sunland, to Hunga, like in one day. Well, good thing you own a Prius. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it is good. And uh, I think for us to be able to crisscross this city, we don't have to wait for others to deliver this campaign. I'm going to take it straight to the people. I'm getting volunteers. We just had our first volunteer meeting. We had almost 100 people come out. This is a year out. People are psyched. And, and I invite you, if any of you want to volunteer on the campaign or make a small donation or get involved, you know, go to ericgarcetti.com. You can go there and we want to involve this to make it the widest, most broad, diverse coalition. Because that's not just good for a campaign, 
that's going to be the kind of mayor I am. That's sort of, uh, of, of administration that I want to have, where we have students who graduate from here and maybe become commissioners a couple years later, uh, people who are able to get involved in their local community if they have an idea of something where we can help them out. That's what it's going to take. So I feel like you're right, your analysis, but it feels pretty heated up to me every single day when I'm on the campaign trail. So then the strategy between now and November is really trying to meet as many uh, groups as possible, but also raising money. Absolutely. And how Absolutely. much do you think it's, how much does it take to run for mayor in 2013? Well, an important part of the campaign will be a television ad or two that you buy at the end. To, to put it in this context, it costs about $1.25 million to run a TV ad enough times that people notice it. It's called, in the business, a thousand points you know, of, of views, that means that people have. So if you want to run two ads, that's 2.5 million. If you want to run one, it's 1.25, and you probably need at least two ads. Then on top of that, you want to have calls that you make and walkers that you send out and the ability to have you know, an internet-based campaign and all those things. So it'll probably be for the top folks a three to four million, maybe even a little bit north of that campaign. Um, just for the first round, that's March. And then you have to raise that much in two months because the runoff, remember, is two months later in May. So it's very expensive, but I think the way that we can, you know, I'm very proud when I jumped in, I jumped in just three months before the end of the year, and we all reported our numbers. And I raised as much in three months as anybody had in nine months. I had half of my donors had never given before to a city campaign. I had donors from all 15 city council districts in the city, which meant every part of the city was represented in my campaign, which it will continue to be. And I had a real, lot of really small donors, a lot of students, young professionals, seniors on fixed income. Um, and I think you campaign the way you're going to govern, and that's how I'm going to govern. So um, that's a lot of money. Yes, it is. And th what's the most that any one individual can give? Most that an individual can give is $1,300. So when you start thinking about uh, the 1.25 to do one commercial and you divide yep. it by 1,300. That's a lot of individuals. You need 1,000 people maxing out to run that one ad. And think about that. It's not easy to find somebody who can give you 1,000. That's a lot of money for mm -hmm. all of us, uh, most of us. You know, there's, there's some people it might not be, but 1,300 dollars. Um, so the average person gives maybe half or a third of that. You've got to find a lot of people every single day who believe in you, who are willing to write a check. And don't get me wrong. A senior on fixed income who gives me a $25 check may be as meaningful to me as a $1,300 check emotionally. But you know, also, I have to get a lot of those $25 checks to get the Well, app. the other thing is, once someone contributes to you, they're going to vote for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, usually, yeah. Yeah, usually. Yeah. Um, so, when, uh, if you could have any one person's endorsement, who would that person be? Who, who would, whose endorsement do you think um, uh, would help you the most for mayor of LA? Yours. Oh, thank you. But I'm not just Fernando. Oh, oh, I thought, okay. I mean, yours. I'm not a big believer. I will have a lot of great endorsements from a lot of people I'm very proud who have been my mentors, who have been co-workers, who have been supporters, who are leaders in environmental community, women's community, labor community, um, schools. But I believe at the end of the day, sure, people want to see a list that you have some endorsements. But at the end of the day, even the very best endorsements. I could have Kofi Annan's endorsement, and you know, I could have the Pope's endorsement, and you know, at the end of the day, it's really, what do I feel about this person? Don't have a second person tell me who this is. Tell me who you are. When I think about what distinguishes the city, uh, I don't see a distinction between the valley and the rest of the city. Now, there may have been that 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but just about every trend that I could take a look at demographically, socially, economically, in terms of public opinion, and even the way LA votes, there is no distinction between the Valley and the rest of the city. So this idea that the Valley has a different political culture, a different you know, social, uh, cultural uh, uh, environment, I, I, I don't buy it. Uh, how do you respond to that? I, I'm so glad you said that, and I agree 100%. I, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley since, since I was born to age 17. Um, I lived on Woodley Avenue, which bisects the valley in half. And the valley is an incredibly diverse place. The valley looked like my family, looked like the city at large. Um, when you talk to the South Asian community in the Northwest San Fernando Valley, African American community in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, Latinos, Anglos, um, all living together, different income levels. Absolutely, this is one city. We happen to have a mountain range that runs through it, but we are Los Angeles. 
And while I want to make sure always the individual neighborhoods of a place, like a Granada Hills has a very unique thing about Granada Hills and a Studio City does, but so too does, you know, Koreatown, so do does, does um, Mar Vista. And it's important to know those nuances of a community, but we are one city and we must be one city to succeed. Hi, Hi. my name is Anne. Hi, Anne. Um, we had Kevin James come speak a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago and one of his main concerns was to change LA to make it more business friendly yes. and to do so by changing the gross tax receipt. Mm -hmm. um, you also seem very pro jobs, but how do you plan on making LA more business friendly and to bring in those jobs? That's Thank you, Anne, for the question. Um, I chair our, our Jobs um, and Business Development Committee now. Um, it was the last thing I did before resigning from City Council Presidency is to appoint myself to that because it was the committee I most wanted to work on. And um, you know, we've we made LA and the neighborhoods that I represent um, some of the more business-friendly areas of Los Angeles now. And Hollywood, for instance, the entertainment industry had left had left for years and was quickly leaving even more what was left in in the district when I started. Taking the gross receipts tax, which is a business tax that says if you have $10 million that go through your business, but let's say your net is negative $2 million, you lose $2 million that year, we still tax the $10 million. So new businesses that are starting up and others, like why would they come to LA when we have such a business unfriendly tax? I was able to waive that gross receipts tax in Hollywood. And I remember Nielsen, you know, it says Nielsen ratings for television and stuff, wanted to come into Hollywood because things were coming back. We were doing a great job with new cafes and the Arclight and Amoeba Records and all of these things. And they said, but LA is too business unfriendly. When I told them I could waive that, they brought 500 jobs that averaged $80,000 per job. And guess what happened? The neighborhood came up even more. We made much more money off of the people dining out and the people shopping and, every, and the property values that went up because there was a stable tenant in that building uh, than we would have uh, if we charged them a gross receipts tax. But it's also the red tape that we have to cut. Um, you know, there was a woman who came to me in Echo Park, um, where I've lived for 10 years. I just moved last year. Um, but we were there for 10 years, and she was maxed out on her credit card, $40,000 in debt, in tears, saying, the city wants to kill my dream of opening up a bakery. She just wanted to make cupcakes. And the bakery was, I don't know, maybe a fifth the size of this room, a very small space. She came to the, to the city, and the first thing they said was, okay, what you have to do is build some underground parking. She's like, underground parking? I'm, I'm a small business. This, this space has been here. It's had other things in it. Why? And they said, well, it's just what it says. It was somebody who wasn't thinking through, how do we get a job going? How do we get business open? But just reading the regulation. Told her she had to install a grease trap, which is the size of a VW Bug. And you know, it, it cost $80,000. And she, that's supposed to be for food that gets fried. Well, she said, I'm not frying anything. I'm just baking. Said, well, does, it doesn't matter. It says right here. And she was about to give up on her dream. We got her through that red tape. And as mayor, I would do that across the board. The LA Times wrote a column about it and said that Garcetti and his office gave her small town help in a big city. That's the ethic I want to get back. I'm going to judge my general managers and my city employees not on how many fines and violations they uncover, but how many jobs they create and how quickly they get businesses open. That'll be my, uh, my metric for success. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. Hi. Hi. My name is Alexandra, and Alexandra. you had mentioned uh, quality of life in a plan for a common future, which mm -hmm. is actually what I've been studying this semester in this class. Right. And I was just curious what you feel the overall quality of life is for the citizens of LA at this current time, especially with the large gap between the rich and the poor. You know, there's, there's certain factors that make quality of life here incredible. Our weather, you know, our geography, <laughs> our ability to go for hikes, be by the ocean. Um, but there's too many places where they're closed out of that. I mean, in my own district, as I mentioned, we had less than an acre of green space for every thousand residents when I started. It's part of the reason we tripled the number of parks. We looked at that. But you also focused in on the income gap. And I think that's a really critical issue. And part of the reason I want to get the city back to work as mayor is I want to make sure that we rebuild that middle class, that right now we have a barbell economy increasingly. I think the richest 300 people in the city have the collective wealth of the next three million. Let that sink in for a second. And our success as a city will be creating opportunities. It goes back to Ann's question just a second ago of if you can create businesses, small businesses, you can build wealth. If you can graduate students who can go into those sectors like technology and healthcare, um, hospitality, that will continue to grow in the city. I mean, the big t three T's, as I call them, trade, technology, and tourism, we can bridge that gap. But it won't happen without some role that government plays and attracting those businesses that need to be here. So I think it starts by focusing on our education system to make sure we're teaching the skills for the jobs of the future. For instance, in healthcare, in my own district, I have Kaiser Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Hollywood Presbyterian. 
My first year, I learned that they weren't advertising anymore in Los Angeles for nurse assistants, which is a good bottom rung and working your way up into a healthcare career. They were advertising in Arizona, they were advertising in the Philippines, but not here in LA. So the way that I would bridge the gap is just what I did with that. I went to the local high schools and said, what are we missing here? Well, we're not teaching any math and science to get people into nursing programs. We turned that around and did it. Then we went to LA City College, which is just down the street from these hospitals. They had killed off their nursing program a few years ago, even though there's jobs there. And so we brought back the nursing program and graduated folks from that. And then once people get a job, we worked with the hospitals and the unions to get people in those jobs. We said, we won't abandon you. We will give you training to get a promotion. So you go from a nurse assistant to maybe a licensed vocational nurse, get more money, help support the family, from a licensed vocational nurse to a registered nurse. So I'd like to, as mayor, focus on those growth sectors to make sure we rebuild a middle class. We cannot succeed as a city if we don't have that. The Thanks. mayor of Los Angeles mm -hmm. is in what we call a weak mayor system, meaning that he is not anywhere near as powerful an executive as the governor of California, mm -hmm. the president of the United States, or Governor Bloomberg in New York, or the or the mayor in excuse me, Mayor Bloomberg in New York, or or the mayor in uh, in Chicago. Um, it, it's difficult for a mayor of Los Angeles to order many people to do almost anything. The council, as you know, can overrule the mayor just about uh, uh, in, in any, any area. If you had, number one, speak to that in terms of how you would manage the mayoralty, given, given how institutionally weak it is, okay? And then number two, if you had the power to wave a wand, what reform would you make in the city of Los Angeles in terms of the city council, the mayor, and, and, and that interaction? Um, I, I will respectfully disagree a little bit that I don't think we're a classic weak mayor system. A weak mayor system is maybe when the mayor rotates and something mm -hmm. with the council and they really have no power. I think we're between a strong and a weak and it's, and it's only been strengthened in recent decades. The reform I would make is to continue to strengthen the mayoralty and I've always said this on the city council so it's not just self-serving for when I'm mayor. I do think we need even stronger powers uh, for the mayor to be able to direct as an executive departments and general managers but you have a tremendous amount of power. You hire every general manager. They get confirmed by the council, but it's rare that a council will ever say so no. So how many general managers are there? Like 35? No, no, there's so over 60. 60 general managers. And 63 so departments. So when you become mayor, the 60 general managers <laughs> under Mayor Virgosa will still be general managers. Correct, but I can, I can fire any of them. The council could overrule that, but that's also very rare. Um, or look for bringing other people in. And I will, I think, look But it's very critical for the students to understand, unlike President Obama, <coughs> When he came in, he got to appoint all of his cabinet. He did actually keep one, Secretary of Defense, mm -hmm. okay? But he immediately, everybody resigned and got to appoint. Here it's different. The 60 general managers will stay unless you proactively Correct. fire them. But you also do have, similar to President Obama, all of our commissioners are usually asked to, to resign. Correct. So all the city commissioners, you have a complete slate that you can bring in, keep the ones who are doing great work and, and look at others. But I think, you know, being a successful mayor, to your question, relies on someone who can both in formal power and informal power be strong. And so if it's just somebody who's like, I'm going to be a bull in a china shop and I'm going to lead the city that way, they will burn out. They, they are not using their informal power of actually convincing the council, convincing mayor, uh, uh, neighboring cities. I mean, look, for instance, recently. I'll, give, I'll make this a concrete thing. We were looking at building a rapid bus lane so a dedicated lane on Wilshire Boulevard from downtown to the ocean. Because of all those people right now west of the 405, part of the reason you have the traffic that you do here is because there's for every four jobs here, there's only one unit of housing. So that means three jobs out of four have to drive in and out every single day. So it's the workforce that can't afford to live here and that, excuse me, doesn't have any place to go. So a bus that would go there more quickly would help those workers get in and out. The bus lane successfully is going from downtown to Beverly Hills. And then Beverly Hills said, no, thank you, we don't want it. So it stops. And it picks up after Beverly Hills for a little bit until it hits the condominiums that are on Wilshire Boulevard and Westwood. And those folks said, no, this isn't really going to be better for us or speed anything up. So it stops there. And then west of the 405, it picks up again after the VA until Santa Monica. And then Santa Monica said, no, thank you, we don't want it. So this will be an unsuccessful bus lane, no question about it. Because the informal <coughs> power that a mayor has of sitting down and saying, with Beverly Hills, tell me what your fear is about this and how can we work through that? Of doing the very difficult work ahead of time was not successfully done this time. It's why we have a subway that stops 
there as well. It's why many of the things that we've tried to do in the past have never been done. I will bring the sort of leadership that will take both the formal things that I can do as mayor, of holding my general managers accountable, giving them metrics, which means numerical goals they have to meet. For instance, if it takes a year and a half for a business to get open now, again, to Anne's question, a year and a half on average, I'd say, can we cut that to a year? And if you can't get that there you know, in, in a year and a half, I'm sorry, I'm going to be asking you to leave. That's the formal role. And the informal role of bringing together our neighboring cities and working well with the city council. You can do amazing things. Chicago, which people point to as a very strong mayor system, mm -hmm. is actually a very weak one on paper. But the strength over time of what they've built up, and also with the party system there, you can actually lead. If you have a strong vision, people will follow. But if you're wishy-washy, nothing gets done. Uh, Eric Garcetti, council member, former president of the council, mayoral candidate. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.